Okay. Hi, this is Stu, and I'm here with Joan Edison, and she's the author of this book out that I read really recently. I thought, God, I've got to catch an interview with her while I was in the UK. It's called Yoga, Fascia, Anatomy and Movement, and we're going to try and explore the world of fascia and biotensegrity and some of this other terminology, but also make it applicable and try and give you an idea as to how this might be used in your yoga practice. So, Joanne, thanks Hi. for being here. First of all, can I, I'm going to pass the book to you, yes. and perhaps you could just tell me a little bit about how the creation of the book came about. Um, well, I worked, uh, originally I studied to become a yoga teacher, Yeah. and um, I was always fascinated by anatomy. My, the teachers that I did my teacher training with were Pete Blackaby and John Sturck. Yeah. Both were osteopaths. So we had a very... Um, should I say anatomically biased stroke biomechanically biased training right and uh, this was in the late 90s uh, I, I started quite a lot before that but it, it was around the 90s when formal yoga teacher trainings were not in their droves as they are now yes. and accreditation in the UK was something kind of we hadn't heard of we were talking about what was going to happen yeah and um one of the things uh, that then came about due to Peter Blackaby's association at the uh, London School of Osteopathy, um, or the Royal College of Osteopaths, I'm not sure which, um, was that he'd met Tom Myers. Right. And uh, he invited Tom over to the UK. So this is by this time about 1998, I think. Yeah. And Tom Myers walked into the classroom and as I describe in the book, he stood there and he basically said, there ain't no muscle connected to no bone, nowhere in no body. <laughs> and there was a stunned silence in the room because, you know, even as yoga teachers where anatomy isn't perhaps our primary yeah. port of call, we, you know, very often you can't even get on a yoga teacher training unless you've done X number of years of practice because yes. it's so based in the do. body being able to do mm. the mm. thing. Um, it was heresy. I mean, he just committed anatomical heresy in the room it, with an American accent, with all his charm. He's very dapper, he's very lovely. And I just said, I thought, I have, to, I have to work with this man. And so by that time, I had four years of yoga experience, I think, and was into the training. And I basically signed up um, over the course of the next yeah. six years to go to America and work with Tom Myers. Wow. So um, I read the proofs of the first Anatomy Trains book. Yeah. And we'll explain what those are yeah. a little bit later. Yeah. Um, and basically, what Tom did, Tom Myers was uh, head of anatomy at the Rolf Institute, I believe. And I think I've got his title right there. But basically, he worked with Robert Schleif and some other people at the Rolf Institute. Yeah. And they were teaching anatomy in what I call joined up writing. And the idea being that rather than a muscle being attached to a bone, that the muscle is in a continuity of soft tissue. Yeah. That means that when it moves, it moves the other muscles in that chain. Yes. Let's call it a chain. He doesn't call them chains. He calls them lines. Okay. So he used the metaphor of train tracks. So there are various rules. If you're talking about an anatomy train, yeah. you have to be on a particular layer. Yeah. And you have to be in a continuous line of pull. Right. So you're talking about a continuous line of pull through yeah. the body. And we're not talking necessarily their functional... That's really? a very great question, Stu. Yeah. That's a very great question because let's say, for example, we're t doing dog pose. Let's, let's yeah. make this mean something to yoga yeah. straight away. If we're doing dog pose, let's just keep it really simple yeah. without being simplistic. Yeah. We lengthen the back yeah. and we fold. <laughs> oh, words in chaos. We lengthen the back and we, we, we close the front, as it were. Yeah. And the idea is that your back line, if you will, is on one particular layer, one continuous line of pull. Yeah. Now, if you're in a dog pose, let's say we're talking about the superficial pack line. Yeah. Clearly, you are lengthening what's called the superficial back arm line, the back of the head, all the way down the back of the body, and so on to the feet. Yeah. Now, in Tom Meyer's anatomy trains, the superficial back line consists of all the muscles and continuous tissues, such as the Achilles, yeah. From the toes, the plantar fascia, the heel Achilles tissue, the gastrox, then the hamstrings, 
to the sitting bones, the yeah. sacrotuberous ligament and the erector spinae and the back of the head, the back of the head, the gallia aponeurotica, all the way down to the brow bone. Okay. And I have a photograph of the first human dissection done based on the anatomy trains and I, I was at the other end of that. And you get it off all in one piece, right? And it, where we took it off in one continuous right. piece. And of course, Tom had to manage a lot of criticism in those early days, about 2001, I believe, the first yeah. edition came out. Um, because the argument was, and this is true, let me tell you, is that you could take a body and cut anything once it's been preserved, set and preserved in okay. the typical embalming procedures. You could arguably do that. In any direction? You could come up with a theory other than anatomy trains and uh, make it true. Yeah. But you'd be hard pushed to make it make as much sense as Tom has done with this work that wasn't just his work originally, yeah. it was his colleagues have acknowledged in, 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 in the later editions. And he, but he, what Tom did, let's be really clear about what Tom Myers has achieved, single handedly really. He took a scythe and he swathed a clearing through a very dense forest of anatomical language and the anatomy of parts, one part at a time. Yeah. And it's a bit like taking the parts of a watch. Let's say you and I go shopping and we buy all the parts of the watch and then we sit there. Yeah. We are a long way from telling the time. Yes. We're a long way from telling the time. Yeah. And I think one of the big problems with yoga is that we work in the physical realm, we work in the kinesthetic realm, we work in the instinctive realm, we work in the intuitive realm, and we bring all that to the table with our own practice because yeah. we're all taught practice, 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 practice. And in, in my yoga teacher training school, the absolute one of my colleagues, taught, Alex, um, was just absolutely you do not ever teach something in yoga that you're not teaching from experience. Right. That puts us in a slightly different place to the intellectual domain that says these are the names of the watch parts. Yes. It's different to the experience, A, of yeah. you and me going and acquiring those watch parts. Yeah. But when we start trying to assemble those watch parts, we're like, we need far more than a list of them. Yeah. Well, if we work in the realm of, of telling the time, Yes. we get to... In yoga, we get to choose watches. You know, what do you want, a blue strap or a pink strap? Do you want to do a stanger or do you want to do a right. What do you want to do? What kind of yoga? What kind of watch are you going to wear you know, yeah. to tell the time? Yeah. What kind of yoga are you going to do to get fit and lean and well and happy and feel good, you yeah. know? But between that bit and the naming of the parts that make the watch, yeah. as anatomists, we're looking at what kind, how can I become a watchmaker? What's the yeah. logic of how this lot goes together? Yes. Yeah? And they all occur in different realms of understanding, let's put it like that. And not all of it's intellectual. And what I bumped into with the writing of the book was that the body's not intellectual. The so body's not an intellectual. It doesn't think domain. it through necessarily. The body, yeah. body finds out on the mat. That's it. Yeah. Actually, the body finds out on the mat. You know, you don't stand in front of a two-year-old and who's trying to walk, or one-year-old, however old they are. And just say, no, 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 bend the knee. No, not that knee, the other one. No, 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 you have to put your foot first. No, no, you don't shout the instructions. Yes. You kind of play with them as they tumble. And that first step is theirs. They tumble and fall and push and pull and go down to go up yeah. enough times yeah. till they get walking. You can't give them a list. You know, you, you can't even... Even the, there's, there's in utero training now, you know, mm. you teach the baby maths through poking and pushing right. and counting, it's unbelievable. But you can't actually teach a baby to walk yeah. in utero by shouting instructions at it so that yeah. it knows what to do when it comes to earth. Mm. Because it, it has to experience the gravity through its tissues. Yeah. So basically what Tom did was gave us still the anatomy of parts, but in joined up writing. Yeah. So we're not saying here, forget the, the more classical approach. No, we're no. saying this is maybe something else to integrate with it. Yeah. And this is step one along a series of steps. Yeah. Because what Tom did was started to move us towards wholeness. Right. Or well, Tom did. It's not like a past. He's still doing it. And so this side through the forest cut down this dense forest and started getting everybody talking about this magical material called yes. fascia. Yeah. So perhaps now would be a good time to tell us what it is that we're actually talking about. So how do we classify fascia? How do you classify fascia? Fascia is, <laughs> that's an interesting question, it's one of the things I came across in the book. 
is there is the formal nomenclature right. of the fascia and there is argument about it. You yeah. might get to that a bit later on. Yeah. The general concept of the fascia, I call it the tissue of the in-between. Right. So when Tom said there ain't no muscle connected to no bone, nowhere and nobody. Yes. He was referring to the connective tissue matrix that is the back of the skin. Yes. That is the wrapping around the whole body. That is the wrapping around every muscle. It is the wrapping around every, um, it's called neurovascular tract. In other words, all your nerves and all your circulatory yeah. vessels. It is the tissue wrapped around every gland, every um, organ, every single part of you. But it doesn't just wrap around things. It's invested through them. Yes. So it's also what holds what's called the extracellular matrix together. In other words, the stuff that isn't cells. We're not all cells. So we've we got are the stuff meshes between, and bindings yeah. and filters, and these meshes act like filters. And different substances are designed to go through different filters. You know, cerebrospinal fluid is designed to be. A, where it's designed to be and yes. when, a, when a disc ruptures and cerebrospinal fluid escapes it's not supposed to do that so the whole body is made up of containers made of this fabric this connective tissue fabric yeah. in this sea of colloids and emulsions and foams yeah. and soft matter that we are and there are some very dense connective tissue parts which is the bones yeah and so even that is quite sort of, well, connective tissue, but then sometimes people, so we might say that fascia is connective tissue, but not all connective tissue is fascia. Correct. Is that right? And, but then there's discussion about what exactly is fascia. The big discussion, there's two big discussions. One is blood is a form of connective tissue. Right. But blood is the department of the developmental biologists and it's micro level and we are in this discussion and we have to put you have, have to understand science has to put boundaries around things in yeah. order to study them in order to ask the questions that mean the researchers can do the research that gives us the answers that means we can even think we know what we're talking about right. so we to have to honor and embrace that so even though the science from back since Descartes yes who did a turf deal with the Pope to get permission to dissect human bodies right and the turf deal was very simple you can have the body for science the church keeps jurisdiction over the mind the emotions the spirit in order to preserve the well-being so that person doesn't go to hell right so we preserve all that you can have the body and it in candace pert's words in molecules of emotions she said this turf deal prescribed a rift in medicine and Western anatomical study ever after. Because right. the being was dissociated from the doing yeah. functioning body. And of course we talk about, in yoga, we have a direct connection to emotions and physical body, don't we? We never segregated it. Yeah. They didn't do that in the East. They did yeah. it in the West. But that segregation is so profoundly inherited in our classic notions yeah. that we're not saying the classic notions are wrong. That, that would be ridiculous. You know, we've done really well so far. We've saved lives with those classic notions. Let's not diminish them to anything less than they are. Yeah. This is evolution. This is to include and transcend that which precedes. Yeah. So we're saying the muscle and the bone is part of the locomotor's tissues, but they are a triumvirate. Muscle bone fascia yeah. is what organises all those tissues. Yeah. So back to what you said about the naming. Yeah. The blood is connective tissue, but that's the developmental biology. Right. And the other bone of contention, excuse the pun, yeah. is whether bones are connected tissue or not. Yeah. Now, that takes us into biotensegrity, which we won't go to just yet. But basically, as far as our ability to hold ourselves open as a volume, yeah. like not just a flat pack kitchen, like yeah. a diagram. Yeah. When you look at a muscle in a diagram, it's two-dimensional, but yeah. we occupy and breathe into and breathe out of three-dimensional space at least, yeah. at least three dimensions. And in order to do that, the bones have to tension the fascia. So we'll, we'll explain we're that in a bit. But what we're mm. looking at at the moment is the fact that you and I do not, you know, did you ever remember, in, I don't know if you grew up in England, in the Tom and Jerry cartoons? Yes. 
they were just so fabulous. And you'd have Tom and Jerry running around, and then the the, the gardener would take a steamroller over Tom the cat, and he would go completely That's flat like, and rock, rock back and forth, yes. and then he pop yeah. up into three dimensions like that. Yeah. So what Tom did with the anatomy trains, if you use them wisely, and this yeah. is a real caveat for yoga teachers, you cannot use anatomy trains straight out of the anatomy trains book and make sense of yoga, in my opinion. Right. Then you'll tell it's us how humble. we might use it it's a bit not later. It's very humble, sorry, yeah. Tom, but it just doesn't work. Right. You have to work with a minimum of two lines at any one moment because you're yeah. a volume. But what we've got to remember is that we've gone from two-dimensional flat pack, and Tom is taking us into three dimensions. Biotensegrity takes us through three dimensions. Yeah. That's just think of it like that, two, three, four, even yeah. dimensions. Let's go back to us volume. In that volume, because we occupy space, we must be tensioned. Now I want you to think now about what we mean by a tensioned system. Yeah. And you have an example yeah, for so us. Yeah, so I'm gonna talk about three examples. I'm gonna talk about a tent or a marquee actually, because right. it's grand and it makes more sense. Right. I'm gonna talk about a spider's web. And I'm going to talk about the human or a biologic form. Yeah. A spider's web can be formed between posts. Yeah. It can also be formed on something like a, a rose bush. Yes. And so if I said to you, oh, it's two dimensional, you could look at me and go, well, actually, it's not because it can be at different angles, it can yes. have threads, it can... Yeah, it might attach can, to a branch that's going yes, this way and it, a branch that's going that precisely. way. Precisely. Yeah. But it's a tensioned network that the spider forms. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that network has an outside frame. Yeah, so, so that's even the spider tree or the bush or the... Exactly. Yeah. So even the spider they've just recently taken up into space and everyone's going, oh, spiders can make webs in space. Yeah. That's not strictly true. The spider had to be in a container to make a web in space. It yeah. can't attach the web to air. Yeah. It could weave, but it, it has to start. It's got to, it's got to have an outside frame. Yeah. And that is called a tension compression system. It's an right. example, a very simple example of a tension compression architecture. Yeah. Marquee. Think of your marquee. Central guy wire. Panels of tensioned fabric. Yeah. Tensioned by guy wires yeah. pegged into the ground. Different forms of building materials, but nevertheless tensioning each other versus the compression pole yes. and the compression poles inside the fabric. Yeah. Yes? And the cross the cross, the cross the bars and all yeah. of those things. Yeah. Now, are they continuous? Are those compression elements continuous? The answer's no, they can't be. Because every angle yes. that the marquee has, has to have a join, yeah. you get a little bit of plastic to join yeah. them, so that it's got some flexibility, but it joins them up. Yeah. But they must be distinct. The actual metal pole can't be continuous, otherwise you'd have a flat. Yes. You wouldn't have a shaped yeah. volumetric architecture. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. Now, the marquee is still a tension compression architecture, but it is not a tensegrity. And there's various people writing about tensegrity saying, oh, it's like a roof, and it, no, it's not. Okay. It, it's a, a tension compression architecture, but it has to be stabilised by being pegged to the ground. Yes, so this is our tent. This is our marquee. Yeah. And it, like the spider's web, it yeah. may be a more multi-dimensional tension compression yeah. system, but it still isn't a tensegrity because it has to be pegged to the ground. It yeah. has to have an outside frame. Now, then we get to us, number three. We do not have an outside frame. We have an internal frame. We have what's called internal floating compression members. Okay. And those internal floating compression members are our bones tensioning the tissue. We discover bones don't touch each other. They literally float in a sea of continuous tension. Now, I'll explain that in a minute, but I want to finish the question about the naming. Yeah. yeah. Bones are discontinuous. Yeah, so we have those spaces that we would the think joints of joints. Are, yeah, yeah, all of that. If you took all those away, you have these discontinuous, even the rib basket. Right. You know, there's, there's cartilage where ribs sit on sternum, ribs sit in spine, and then the underneath ribs, the lower ones that attach by a cartilage to the one above, because yeah. this is a this is a springy basket. Yeah. Must be sprung and it must 
en- enclose the body wall. It is the torso. It's a volume. Yes. The bones are discontinuous, and in the in the nomenclature, the official scientific version, fascia's definition is that it is a continuous matrix of tissues throughout the body. Right. It is also a force transmission system. In other words, it transmits the forces of walking, standing, gravity, yes. the environment being pushed by the wind, pushing back, all those things. We are a force transmission system. Yeah. Electrical forces, chemical forces, mechanotransduction forces, where we, we turn a mechanical impulse transduced through the body into a piece of information. Yeah. All these chemical, biological, physical changes are yes. all transmitted through this tissue that is ubiquitous yeah but in the naming the name the word continuous excludes bone right so bone is still uh, a connective tissue isn't it but well, it's this is where the big argument comes from right. dr stephen levin who is known very affectionately by yeah. his colleagues of whom i'm very proud to say i'm one is the father of biotensegrity, or uh, as John Sharkey calls him, the protagonist of biotensegrity. And he rejects both titles because he's Ah, very self-effacing. But the the thing is, he was an orthopaedic surgeon. Yes. And just to put some context on this, he did, I think one of the things he did was an operation to the ankle, to fuse the ankle. Right. I hope I got this right, Steve. (laughs) And... In doing so, in theory, if everything's the way it says it is in the yeah. books, if you cut every single ligament in the ankle, right. you could fuse the bones readily. Okay. But he couldn't. So he couldn't get them close enough to touch. Okay. Until he severed ligaments higher up the leg that were part of whatever was holding the joint apart yeah. as well as together at the same time. Right. Now... Dr. Levin has gone on. I mean, that's another whole story. We do a whole webinar on on, on biotensegrity. It's fascinating. But Dr. Levin basically went on to explore what makes sense of biologic forms because he was trained rigorously in levers and upright inverted pendulums and... So what we would call a more classical Classical anatomical approach. But he had to, as an orthopaedic surgeon, change people's organization and it just didn't it was a spinal specialist and it was the spine particularly just didn't make sense if you do the maths of the engineering that we base our spinal calculations on yeah then somebody picking up a a fishing rod and doing that with the fly and sending it out through the water would shear their body in pieces all over the place just from the the maths right what a, a compression structure like a, a building column yeah. would do with those forces. You can't put those forces into um, biologic forms and explain them with the same physics because yeah. we're not hard matter, we're soft matter. Yeah. So basically the classical extrapolations, if you will, from how anatomy and physiology work so that we can move around. Yes are based on hard matter physics. And more mechanical principles. Mechanical principles of hard matter. We abide by mechanical principles, but they're not the same principles as hard matter because we're soft matter. So the big problem is, according to some of the work of uh, a colleague of Dr. Levin, I think his name's Wolf, but I'm not sure if I'm getting muddled up with Wolf's law of how the bony matrix is Maybe we can slide it in there. If the name is wrong, we'll... We'll correct it. Yeah. Um, and what what he suggests is that the addition of hydroxyapatite, which is the the um, the chemical, if you like, yeah. in the uh, cartilage, because when a baby grows, the, most of the baby is cartilage. Apart from the cranium, to start off with it's all cartilage. It becomes bone right. as a result of the forces transmitted through right. it. They are compression forces. So those compression forces stimulate. The, the, the fascia, the periosteal fascia, that yeah. which is around the bone, to form a stronger compressive component due to the muscular actions around it or the myofascial actions yeah. around it. And that basically, Dr. Levin says that bone is starched fascia. Yes, now I've heard that term before. Mm. And it's a very interesting line of thought. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm inclined to go with it, but I'm not going to sit here saying, oh, yes, it's starch fascia, <laughs> because there's lots of people arguing it. Yeah. The big issue with the naming, 
And this is really shows that the understanding of biotensegrity is, is on its way, it's coming in. It yeah. was the pre-conference day to the last International Fascia Research Congress and Dr Levin was presented with a major award at the Fascia Research Congress. So, so it's our hope that it's the understanding rolling. will grow. Yeah. But basically, you cannot exclude bone from the naming of what is and isn't fascia on the basis that it's discontinuous because it has to be to hold us open. Yes. If the bone was continuous, we wouldn't mm. be able to move. So I think you were saying before to me off camera that the way that we're trying to understand things, it goes part and part. You need also the biotensegrity model to, to put the into meaning, really. Well, exactly. The thing is, and how we can get this across really simply, I think, is if you imagine a neoprene wetsuit. Yeah. If you're in a neoprene wetsuit, I could describe that as a tensioned bodysuit. Yeah. Yeah? It's tensioned. Yeah. Now, if I unzip it and take, you take it off and it drops on the floor, it deflates. We don't deflate. Yeah. We stay tensioned. Now, how we stay tensioned, what are the guy wires? What are the fabrics? What is the main mast? We can use the marquee as a metaphor. Right. If we remember one thing, the marquee has to be attached to the ground. Yes. So I'm using it as a model. Yeah. But if you could imagine that marquee attached to the sur to a surface that was transparent, could you imagine its reflection? Yes. So it was whole. Yeah. And the guy wires were attached to themselves. And you just had bars coming out the middle to represent the ground. Yes. It would be a tensegrity. Right. Maybe now is a chance to show one of these models so as we can, that people get the idea of what we're talking about. This is a tensegrity model. And one of the things that you notice is that you can hold one end and it doesn't deform. Yeah. It's independent of gravity. And you could extent. put that on any end it would support yeah, itself, you can, wouldn't it? You can hold it anywhere. Yeah. It, it doesn't lose its yeah. structure. It doesn't yeah. fall apart. So in other words, you can tilt it. Now, if you have a column model, yes. you can't tilt a column. So we're now talking about like structure. we would build a continuous compression structure with like blocks. A house. Yeah. yeah, bricks. Yeah. You know, the, you've got the foundation, you've got the brick pillars, and then you have to have all the struts in the roof. Now, they may appear to look a bit like one of these, yeah. but they are absolutely dependent on the support underneath, underneath which it. is based on compression forces. Yeah. This is continuous tensional members. You can see that there are joints here. I mean, I built this, so this yeah. was sent to me by Bruce Hamilton, very, very clever guy who's making guitars at the moment and not making these. So right. This is very precious to me. Um, and, and I put the rods in, or the yellow ones were already there, I put the blue and the red ones in, right. so the whole structure tensions itself. Yeah, and if they can see as you move it around that none of these rods actually touch, touch one other. another, there's yeah. a space, and they're really just held in place by the tensional part of the yeah. model. Yeah. Now, where we start moving into getting it like the body, as you expressed to me off camera, yeah gets a bit complicated yeah. because we're not all organized as the bars these are not like if i say these are represent the bones and this represents the ligaments for example yeah. or the myofascial continuities yeah. this is a regular organization and this clearly isn't yeah so, so what i said to you off camera was wasn't it i said when you look at the spine you can see that the upper vertebra the cervical bodies even when they like the whole thing are much smaller than the ones at the bottom. The spine, yeah. So that would make it, you lead you to the conclusion that there must be some form of compressional forces that are greater towards the bottom than the top because they're not all denser. the same. They're yeah. denser, they're yeah. bigger, and yeah. they're meatier. Yeah. So because they're designed for a different quality yeah. of movement, of mobility. Mm. So um, yeah. So this is what this is is a map of a close packing system. Yeah. So that sounds a bit complicated, but actually it's not. If I had a, if I had a box that was this size yeah. and it was full of um, golf balls yeah. and then that covered a whole row and then I had a, another row that were in the gaps 
Yeah. And then I had another row on top. And I made a map of how they fit together. Yeah. It would look like this. So, so where this they're touching. Map. So where they're touching. So, well, sort of. This would be, each one of these would be the centre of one of the balls. Right. And these would be the forces containing them in their organisation. Yeah. And this would be going from centre to centre of the ones that don't touch. So yeah. it would be one ball, another ball, another ball, another ball, another ball. So they'd all be on different levels. Yeah. But this would be, if you imagine that something's containing them, our neoprene wetsuit, something's yeah. containing them, for them to push out and push in at the same time. So what's very interesting is the properties of this architecture. It's very light. Yes. It encloses space. Things can move through it without distorting it. I can put my hand right through it. Yeah. And I don't distort it. I don't damage it. I don't tear it. Yeah. So if you imagine the wind or fluid could move through this. Yes. So start thinking about the properties of this in three dimensions as yeah. being actually quite useful, if you can imagine that. And now I'm going to give you this and ask you to push the ends together and then pull them apart and then try and bend, bend it. it. And tell me, don't go mad, because it obviously does have a, 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 a critical <laughs> It has mass. a breaking point. Yes, everything does. But just notice that it, no matter what you do, it resists you. Yeah. And it gets more stronger the more force you Precisely. use to compress it. Precisely. That is exactly what your body does. Yeah. So if I was to go like this and start pushing you, pushing yeah. you will start resisting yes. me and coming back. Yeah. And that's what we do when we walk on the ground. We push into the ground and then we really use it to move. And we, our whole motion process is, is based in something that is not answered by levers and upright inverted pendulums. Yeah. It just isn't. And perhaps you could just explain to us, you know, the classical lever we're thinking, sometimes they talk, they look at the elbow, don't they? Because yeah. it's the, the simplest. I will, uh, yeah, I'll talk about the elbow in a second because I want to talk about the upbar yeah. as well. But what I wanted to say to you about the anatomy trains is Tom calls the anatomy trains now the body's geodesics. Right. So we call, the, so he, he refers to them as lines. Yes. I refer to them as bands. Okay. And I just ask people to remember that they are bands of possibility in body reading in a right. class. Right. So yeah. can you explain that a little, little bit more in depth for us, what that means? Um, and I promise I won't forget about the elbow. <laughs> um, but that's one of the things with fascia, isn't it? It's, it's so bringing it's everything connected. together. It is. Yeah, it, it, so. so back to connective tissue. So fascia is connective tissue, but not all connective tissue is fascia. Yes. So blood is connective tissue. There's this discussion about bones are connective tissue, but whether they should be named fascia. Yes. And the question is whether, classically, there was always fascia. Please understand, fascia hasn't just appeared. Fascia was always there, yeah. always recognised and always understood. Okay. Always understood? Yes, or? it wasn't. Its significance wasn't understood. Right. So fascia was considered way back to be a, a sort of packaging material yeah a kind of inert scaffolding a bit like the packaging stuff inside an envelope when you get a padded envelope yeah. you know it makes it padded it gives it its shape yeah and it's useful because it you know it supports yeah. all of those things but maybe a bit of a nuisance when you're dissecting something. A, a huge nuisance when you're dissecting yeah. something to the extent that you scrape it away and put it in the cadaveric bins yeah now 200 years ago a man called a naturalist called John Godman, yeah. trained his students to um, dissect the fascia. He was an American naturalist, very young man, very unusual reasons he got to be where he was. Yeah. And he told them to forget all the systems that they were learning, because, I mean, I could wax lyrical for hours about the history <laughs> of anatomy. It's just <laughs> amazing, but it, it does explain how we got here yeah. at this point. Um, but anyway, to keep it concise, he... He advised and recommended that his students just look and observe. Yeah. So rather than coming to the body looking for the locomotor system, the muscles and the bones, and scraping everything out of the way that wasn't a muscle on a bone, yeah. he got them to look at everything. And he said he knew of nothing other than the f nothing like the fascia as the keystone to mm. every part of the body. And, and mm. the book he wrote is. It's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. 
And in it, he wrote, I know um, of nothing. Let me, actually, I can read it. it the quote's in here. It's just such a beautiful quote. Um, John Godman, here we go. He espoused a principle of honest observation of all that was in front of the student in order that they could fully appreciate the connected nature of all the anatomical parts they were asked to understand. So even, yeah, so we're talking about connectivity we're back then. We're talking about a man who lived mm. from 1794 to 1830. So he was yeah. only 36 when he passed over. Wow. But he was quite an extraordinary yeah. young man. And he s insisted they ignored the preconceived notions of named systems and looked at the parts in their context of this continuous tissue, the fascia. He went on to detail the class observations of this tissue as a connected whole throughout the torso. I quote, The following investigations were begun without reference to any system and without the slightest wish to support any preconceived opinions. The conclusions drawn were unavoidable, even at first inspection, and their correctness was more firmly established by every subsequent examination. And it was almost 200 years ago that John Godman wrote presciently at the end of his introduction, the novelty of these descriptions will perhaps be the greatest impediments to their general acceptation. For it has been very correctly remarked by an illustrious anatomist, Geoffroy St. Hilaire, that there are many persons who become furious at the mere enunciation of new ideas. Like him, however, we shall wait patiently, convinced that time fixes everything in its place. <laughs> that was 200 years ago. Yeah. So then we had um, what the biggest development, or the one, one of the significant, not the biggest, no, not true, one of the biggest elements that then ensued straight after that was in the, in the late 1800s was Virchow, yeah. who considered to be the father of modern pathology, developed microscopy further and stated that the cell was the basic unit of the body. Yeah. And what that basically did was had us all hone in on the parts of the watch and forget that we use it to tell the time. Yeah, so the minute, minute, breaking smaller, down, smaller, breaking, smaller, breaking smaller, down. Smaller, smaller, yeah. And it was like, this is the thing. And everybody went zoom and honed in on this microscopic cell yeah. as the unit of life. Your body's not all cells. There's cells in there, yeah. and there are cells that make up, that have patterns that make up what we call the liver, because yeah. that's packed full of liver cells. Yeah. But the, the, the baby isn't born with a bunch of cells that go marching off to make themselves into a liver. It, it just doesn't work like that. Yeah. It, it starts as a the result of, of, of fertilization, a conceptus, and the... It, it becomes the zygote, and, and according to Yuck van der Waal, who I, I want to talk about, is this is not a cell, this is the beginning of a being. Right. And reducing things down to a cell, and the misunderstandings we had about how the cell membrane is formed, and all this, this is where mm -hmm. all these ideas have come from. Yeah. And straight after that, um, and in fact, it's not straight after, it's pretty much the same time, but he was a bit older, he grew a bit older than Virchow, was Andrew Taylor Still, yeah. the osteopath, who created osteopathy, the father of osteopathy. A physician and surgeon who became the founding father of osteopathy, and interestingly still referred to the body as a machine, but he offered the idea that it was designed to heal itself by a force greater than itself. Right. He wrote of the inclusive aspect of the soul, rather than keeping it segregated since... Yes, before... You know, we, no, we haven't... I don't think we've got to... Yeah, no, Descartes had already segregated it in, uh, of course, in the Renaissance, in 1596-1650. Yeah. So in the 1600s, it had all been segregated. Yeah. And um, Andrew Taylor still, we're now 1828 to 1917. Yeah. So we're about 100 years ago, almost 100 years ago. This life, he writes, is surely too short to solve the uses of the fascia in animal forms. That's just a very interesting statement in yeah. itself. The li this life is surely too short to solve the uses. So this is where people are having problems with fascia or getting away with writing nonsense because they, they can pick on one aspect and yeah. say so much about it because it's so fascinating. Yes. Basically, it's a building material with multiple characteristics. Yeah. Think of sand. Sand can be sand, sand can be used to make bricks, sand can be used to make cement, sand yep. can be ground like glass. 
it all starts as sand. Yes. So think of fascia as being a building material of soft matter that is many, many different manifestations and expressions according to whether it's under tension or compression. And I think you mentioned, and you give an example in your book of it could be like candy floss or it could be like a leather strap. It, it can, can also be. It can be more yeah. fluid and yeah. it can, um, it, it depends how it's preserved. Yeah. And it depends how it's hydrated. Right. So these are all interesting things. But let yeah. me just read the rest of this piece because yeah. it's fabulous. The fascia penetrates even its own finest fibres to supply and assist its gliding elasticity. Yeah. Just a thought of the completeness and universality in all parts. This, this is yoga to me. I mean, this is just yoga. This is like, what's <laughs> yoga? Oh, yoga is about union. Well, actually, think about it. It's about unifying. Yeah. It's not about uh, union. There's no uh. It's yeah. unifying. It's the process of unifying movement through a form. And, and this, just, this was just yoga in its core. Even though you turn the visions of your mind to follow the infinitely fine nerves, the nerves are wrapped in fascia, by the way. So that's, you know, the dura is fascia. So adding to that. Yes, it's all... The, the, with, with the language is the issue. Yeah. Let's get there. There you see the fascia, and in your wonder and surprise, you exclaim, omnipresent in man and all other living beings of the land and sea, other great questions come to haunt the mind with joy and admiration, and we can see all the beauties of life on exhibition by that great power with which the fascia is endowed, the soul of man with all the streams of pure living water seems to dwell in the fascia of his body. And writing in a way that hops back to Hippocrates, which, yeah. was, which was at the same sort of time as Ayurvedic medicine and with similar principles, the fascia I know, or of the fascia, I know of no part of the body that equals the fascia as a hunting ground. What he means is that whatever the problem is, if you can sort out the fascial contribution to it, yeah. you can probably make a big difference. I believe that more rich golden thought will appear to the mind's eye as the study of the fascia is pursued than any division of the body. Still, one part is just as great and useful as any other in its place. We need all of it. You know, if you're yeah. just fascia, you'd be a ghost stew walking around. <laughs> I mean, we'd know who it yeah. was because yeah. it would have your morphology precisely inside and out. Yeah. It'd be literally a ghost of you. Yeah. But we need the other bits because the ghost couldn't survive if the heart wasn't pumping and the brain wasn't doing yeah. what it does and so on and so forth. No part can be dispensed with, but the fascia is the ground in which all causes of death do the destruction of life. Every view we take, a wonder appears. I dislike to write and only do so when I think my productions will go into the hands of kind-hearted geniuses who read not to find a book of quotations, but to go with the soul of the subject that is being explored for its merits, weigh all truths, and help bring its uses front for the good of man. And I think, as yoga teachers, and forgive me the arrogance, but I really, I love calling all my, you know, my the, the people that graduated from my yoga teaching yeah. training are kind-hearted geniuses. That's yeah. what they are. Yeah. They are lovely people who are utterly devoted to making a difference in people's lives to having their bodies move in a way that has them feel happier, whatever yeah. age they are, Stu. Yeah. And whatever type of um, idea that they want to do this type of yoga or that type of yoga, it's all, it's all okay. Yoga's incredibly tolerant. And we also talk about versatility as well and the fact that it is change and not doing the same thing all the time that is actually healthier for fascia and the body at home yeah because what happens with the fascia is the, the, the movement trains the fascia yeah and if we do the same movement over and over and over again we get repetitive strain injuries yeah. now we go around saying oh i've got rsi but often you can meet somebody with rsi you know this you're a hands-on mm. practitioner as mm. well as a movement teacher a yoga teacher you you get people coming in as if, the, as if this rsi happened to them like you know a seagull in isolation on. Yeah. It's not like that.